Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon in New York. Good evening in Vienna, in Berlin. And we hope, as soon as Avishai joins us, a good evening in Jerusalem. Uh, my name is Elisabetta Martina. I'm uh, a professor of sociology and liberal studies and the director of the Transregional Center for Democratic Studies. Um, when late last fall, I asked Michael Ignatiev whether we could talk at the New School about his book on consolation, which was just coming up in the States, on consolation, finding solace in dark times. Um, neither of us imagined that uh, when we meet in early spring, uh, the subject of uh, personal suffering will suddenly multiply in front of our eyes, expand numerically and, and wide, in kind of wide ranging condition, especially palpable in the large parts of Europe right now, Central and Eastern Europe, especially. Uh, we are at the new school and here with our roots in the university in exile that hosted scholars, endangered scholars, um, endangered by the Nazi Germany, um, re Nazi uh, regime in Germany. Um, we feel that almost viscerally and, uh, and, and our thoughts go to our colleagues and our alumni in Ukraine and wherever they are. And um, this, I feel, uh, I think this con conversation today is a real gift to all of us. Um, the event is organized by the Transitional Center for Democratic Studies, along with the Social Research International Journal, and is co-sponsored by the Sociology Department at the New School for Social Research. Uh, let me very quickly and very briefly move to the New School. My colleague, Professor Arian Mack, who is with us today, but not on the screen, asked me to extend her greetings and thanks to Michael Ignatia for allowing us to host this discussion on his wonderful, recent and couldn't be more timely book on consolation. And to uh, Arjuna Padurai, Jim Miller and Avishai Margalit, which we still hope will be able to arrive from Jerusalem to reach our screens soon. Um, I'd like to read a note that uh, Arian Mack, Professor Arian Mack had sent to me this morning. All of the participants to today um, have written in social research. The journal is published since 1934. And one of them, Arjuna Padurai, is a member of its editorial board. The new issue of the journal, actually, I am also the member of the editorial board. That's, I just remember. <laughs> the, the, the new issue of the journal, which was published yesterday, is on xenophobia, uh, which is also a far too timely, writes Arian. Um, problem and inevitably evokes the need for consolation. Equally and unfortunately timely is um, the initiative we launched here at the New School in 2018, the New University in Exile Consortium, which will soon, soon have 50 member universities from all around the world and hosts more up to date, more than 60 threatened and exiled scholars whose number keeps increasing at an alarming rate as a consequence, not only of the trend to authoritarian occurring in too many countries, but most of all, from the fall of Afghanistan and the unprovoked invasion in, uh, of Ukraine by Russia. I'm grateful to Michael Ignatiev for having agreed from the start to serve on the advisory board of the consortium. And we urge ev anyone in the audience today who is uh, attached to university one way or another that a university that it's not the member yet, uh, to not the member of the consortium yet, um, urge the, to urge the university to join us, to join us at a time when the work we do to assist threatened scholars and students is more urgent than ever. That was Arian. Thank you, Arian. Um, let me briefly introduce the, our author, our today's author, uh, Michael Ignatiev. And I will be short, those introductions, those bios that I will offer and throughout that, that meeting, uh, introducing panelists, and right now Michael Ignatiev are going, going to be relatively short as the full bios are, on the, are, are included in the announcement of this event. Michael Ignatiev uh, is rector or president emeritus and professor of history at Central University, uh, European University, CEU, Prior to that, he was Edward R. Morrow, Chair of the Press, Politics and Public Policy at, 
uh, at the Harvard Kennedy School. He served as Centennial Chair at the Carnegie Council for Ethics and International Affairs in New York. Um, a little bit uh, further back, between 2006 and 2011, Michael Ignatiev served as an MP in the Parliament of Canada and then as a leader of the Liberal Party of Canada and leader of the official opposition. He is a member of the Queen's Privy Council for Canada and holds 13 honorary degrees. Uh, he's author of 20 books, and I'm not going to read the titles, but yeah. you may know many of them. Many of us teach um, uh, fragments or entire books in our classes at the universities. Um, and among them, you may remember is, uh, the book on Isaiah Berlin, Fire and Ashes, Blunt, uh, Blood and Belonging, and more. Uh, Michael, on Consolation is now in the stores, and you, um, you in the audience, you should get it. Uh, but in the meantime, I'd like to ask Michael to start with a brief reading from the book. Thank you. Um, thanks very much. Thanks to New School. Thanks to Ari and Mac, who I've known for, I guess, 40 years. And um, thanks, Elisabetta. Thanks, James, uh, Arjun, and Avishai all the way out there in, in uh, Jerusalem. It, it's an enormous privilege for me to be in such distinguished company. Let me get down to business and I'll read just a very short bit of the beginning of the book uh, to get us, get us started. It's from the introduction. I'm visiting a friend who lost his wife six months ago. He's frail but unsparingly alert. The chair where she used to sit is still in its place across from his. The room remains as she arranged it. I brought him a cake from a cafe that they used to visit together when they were courting. He eats a slice. And when I ask him how things are going, he looks out the window and says quietly, if only I could believe that I would see her again. There's nothing I can say. So we sit in silence. I came to console, or at least comfort, but I can't do either. To understand consolation, it's necessary to begin with the moments when it's impossible. Console, it's from the Latin consolor, to find solace together. Consolation is what we do or try to do when we share each other's suffering or seek to bear our own. What we're searching for is how to go on, how to keep going, how to recover the belief that life is worth living. But here in this moment with my old friend, I'm reminded how difficult this is. He's truly inconsolable. He refuses to believe that he can live without her. Trying to console him takes us both to the limits of language. And so words trail off into silence. His grief is a deep solitude that cannot be shared. In its depths, there's no place for hope. This moment also lays bare what it's like to live in this time after paradise. For millennia, people believed that they would live, they would see their loved ones again in the afterlife. They imagined it vividly, and the great artists depicted it: clouds, angels, celestial harps, unending plenty, freedom from toil and illness, but above all, the reunion, this time forever, with the beloved. Paradise was the form that hope has taken for thousands of years, but what Shakespeare said of death is true of paradise. It's the country from which no traveler returns. By the 16th century, Europeans began to suspect that no such country ever existed. In the 21st century, unbelief now commands the hearts and minds of many, though not all of the people I know. What unleashed unbelief among many other forces was an ideal of truth. If my old friend succumbed to his own longing to believe, he would feel he had betrayed himself. So this is where we are today, heirs both to traditions of consolation and to the centuries of revolt against them. What consolations can we still believe in today? Thank you, Michael. I uh, I wanted very much for him to read it for us and to 
actually hear the voice, but also hear, hear the voice of his of his of his book, which is uh, um, which which now I would like to ask him actually to tell us a little bit more about. Um, after that, welcome Avishai. We didn't we we were nervous that we are missing you. Thank you for for joining in uh, on time. After um, uh, uh, after Michael kind of says uh, his uh, uh, words, general words about the book, kind of introducing it at, uh, to, to, the, to the public at large. Um, we will, I will turn to the panelists. I introduce them individually. And I will start with Arjun, followed by Jim Miller, uh, Avishai. If there's enough time, I will, I will, I will jump in. Um, and this is our plan for now. For the audience, the uh, important information is that at some point you are uh, welcome and invited to send us your questions, and we will try to accommodate that at the end of the of the of that uh, afternoon evening uh, meeting. Michael, Thank tell you. us more about the book. Yeah, sure, sure. Let me let me try and explain how this project began. It began four or five years ago, long before COVID, long before this atrocity in Ukraine it, in, a, in another era, another time. Um, I went to a choral concert in which the Psalms were being sung, and I'm a secular person. I'm an unbeliever, but I was tremendously moved by the Psalms, tremendously moved by the music. And I began to ask myself why I was consoled by Psalms that whose promise, whose religious promise of, 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 of hope and salvation I didn't believe in. So the project began as an attempt to understand why it is that secular people like myself could be consoled by um, uh, propositions um, that I don't actually believe in. And as I began, I began working on the Psalms and began to realize that the consolation I derived from the Psalms, and the Psalms are among the most consoling uh, words ever uh, written, uh, the consolation came through identification. The thing about the psalmist 2,000 years ago is they understand what grief is. They understand what loss is. They understand what desperation is. And so the consolation you feel is a sense of deep identification across time, a kind of solidarity across time, even if you don't believe the hope that they promise. So I began with that paradox, how it is that secular people could be moved and, and, and consoled by um, uh, religious propositions. And then I began to work out just following my nose. I then began to look at St. Paul's epistle to the Corinthians. And you know, what struck me about St. Paul's epistle, <clears throat> this famous um, epistle devoted to love was how desperate it is. If I have faith that can move mountains and have not love, I am nothing. You know, prophecies may fail, but if I have love, I can get through. This is a man trying to build Christian communities across the Eastern European, uh, across the Eastern Mediterranean um, in the sort of 40, 50 AD. And it's a desperately difficult business creating these Christian communities. And I, the St. Paul that I found consoling was the St. Paul that was also often desperate, often lonely, but who found in the love of the people that he worked with um, the consolation that would have to satisfy him until the Messiah comes. So I'm looking uh, across these religious traditions and seeing ways in which they can move us despite the fact that we may not believe in the promise they offer us. I think I had the same approach when I went on to look at the Roman Stoics. You know, I, I ended up being much less interested in Cicero, the proud Roman orator, scourge of um, Caesar, and much more interested in the Cicero who lost his own daughter, a guy who had perfected the discourse of consolation and wrote kind of knowing, consoling words to um, his male friends. And all of these words turn out to be useless to him when he loses his own daughter. Similarly, when I looked at Marcus Aurelius, you know, the, the Roman emperor, it changed my view of the meditations, which people are reading for thousands of years, to realize that it was written in what is now near Vienna, 
um, he's, he's leading a brutal counterinsurgency war against the barbarians. And when you read it through that lens, you begin to see this is an old guy at the end of his tether fighting a war he hates. Uh, it's bloody, it's awful, it's disturbing. And I see the meditations not as a kind of suave, serene, you know, disquisition on stoic self-mastery, but a guy trying to hold himself together in very desperate times. And I think you begin to see how my approach to all these texts began to take shape. I took a overtly um, biographical approach, trying to situate these texts in the context of the drama, the crisis that uh, produced them. And I, I came increasingly to the view that what is consoling about these uh, works is not the doctrines that they purvey, but the, the example that they uh, exemplify. It's people, not doctrines, that console us, I ended up, I ended up uh, thinking. And it's also chains of meaning across time. One of the chains that I followed was the Roman senator Boethius, who is sentenced to death by a barbarian king in 524 and writes the very famous book called The Consolations of Philosophy. And what's interesting is that, you know, Dante, a thousand years later, or 800 years later, is influenced deeply by, by uh, Boethius and carries on this struggle to think through the extent to which philosophy can ever console us. And he then passes this on a further thousand years to Primo Levi in Auschwitz in 1944. And one of the most astounding moments to me in the, in the 20th century is when Primo Levi is walking through Auschwitz and um, he is teaching one of his fellow inmates a little Italian and suddenly finds himself reciting Dante. Uh, and as they get to the soup terrines, he suddenly remembers the key line in Dante, which is, you were not born to be brutes, but to be followers, followers of virtue and knowledge. And they, these words from Dante um, give him a, an extraordinary sense of consolation in the specific sense that they conjure up a world beyond the barbed wire where uh, one day uh, men can live in freedom and not live as brutes. So I follow these strands, Boethius, um, Dante, Primo Levi over a thousand years. And part of what I'm trying to say is that consolation is a tradition of giving meaning to extremity that is passed from hand to hand across time. I also look uh, at the kind of secular turn in languages of consolation. Montaigne is disgusted by the religious fanaticism of the 16th century and begins to generate an idea of consolation derived from love of ordinary life. Uh, again, it's not doctrine, it's not philosophy, it's the routines of ordinary life. You either love life and are rescued by life uh, or you'll never be consoled. Similar thoughts in, in David Hume in the mid 18th century. Hume goes to the very edge of a nervous breakdown, nervous collapse as he writes the treatise of human nature and yet uh, realizes that it's not philosophy that got him out of his nervous collapse, but diversion, company, sociability, human, uh, human contact. Um, and then I look in addition at uh, other secular turns in the language of consolation, one of the most famous being the Marquis de Condorcet's famous esquisse sketch on the history of, of mankind. He's awaiting, he's, he's in hiding from the French Revolution and tries uh, to write a history of progress of science and technology. He doesn't think he will live to see the progress that he celebrates, but he finds it consoling to imagine this progress and this use of history as consolation is extremely influential. And you see, I think, in Karl Marx, a very strong doctrine of, of history as consolation. Although needless to say, Marx would angrily deny that he's providing you with consolation. He's providing you, he thought, with a science of history, uh, which would have no need for, in which there would be no need for consolation at all. When I get into the 20th century, I work through a number of figures, Max Weber, Camus, and Havel, who are thinking through the, the implications of the secularization 
of languages of of consolation. Um, one of the most interesting figures, obviously, is Albert Camus in the plague, in which he accepts that the world is absurd. There are no ultimate metaphysical meanings that can console us. But what I take from Camus is a very strong sense that despite the sense that there are no metaphysical consolations available to us, it is perfectly clear what human beings have to owe each other in times of extremity. It's perfectly clear that consoling each other in the face of loss and desperation and fear is a duty that doesn't change even when the universe uh, fails to make sense. And the book concludes finally um, uh, in, a, in a perhaps unexpected way by talking about the people, wonderful woman who invented the hospice um, because ultimately the thing we're seeking to console ourselves for is the prospect of death. And unlike many of the other figures in this book who write great works, Cicely Saunders was a nurse and a doctor who decided to try to provide a setting and a place where consolation could occur, where people could encounter the prospect of their death without fear, without loneliness, without panic, without desperation. And I put her in the book partly because I happened to have met her once, but also because she said one thing, which I think was the single most transforming experience of writing the book for me, which she, she began to help me think about my own death, not as the end of everything, but if I had the guts or I had the serenity or I had the calm, an opportunity for me to take away the fear of death from those around me who I love. So that even at the approach of death, we can give consolation and in giving consolation, receive consolation. And that's a pretty powerful message that I think is in the Saunders book. This is not, I'll, I'll stop now, I've gone on a little longer than I intended. This is not a happy talk book. It's not a how-to book. It's a, it's a series of biographical essays of people who reached moments of extremity and somehow found the strength to understand their situation. I hope reading that will be in itself consoling, but I would, I would end where I started when I was reading to you that um, consolation takes us to the very limits of what language can do. And I think everybody who's honest about life knows that there are moments when we're properly inconsolable. So to study consolation is also to study the moment and the place where words fail us and where we, we have to go on alone. So I'll stop there and I, 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 I look forward to the discussion and, and I'll try and keep quiet so that I can listen to other people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, we will turn then now to uh, Arjuna Padurai, who is Emeritus Professor in Media, Culture and Communication at um, NYU at New York University and Distinguished Visiting Professor at Max Planck Institute for Social Anthropology in Halle. Germany. Uh, I also want to add that um, we were lucky to have uh, Arjun as our provost and professor in anthropology at the New School for Social Research at the New School. Uh, so welcome home, welcome back home, Arjun. Arjun is also a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences as a member of the UNESCO Commission on the Future uh, Futures of Education. Uh, he, he's a co-editor of Public Culture and Social research. He is a, uh, he is on the on the board of social research and serves on the editorial uh, board of Global Perspectives. He has authored numerous books and uh, articles, including Fear of Small Numbers and Essay on Geography of Anger, Modernity at Large, Cultural Dimensions of Globalization, and more most recently the Failure. Uh, Arjun, the floor is yours. Oh, well, thank you very much, uh, Elzbieta. It's indeed uh, always a pleasure to be in the uh, milieu of uh, the new school uh, and uh, of colleagues such as uh, yourself, Aryan, Jim, others who may be here today or may not. Uh, my years, they were uh, 
very uh, rich ones for me. They were not easy for reasons we don't need to go into today and uh, for which I have found consolation elsewhere. Uh, <laughs> but, but they had nothing to do, uh, the challenges had nothing to do with the richness of the conversations of the new school, the astonishing work of my colleagues. So I'm very, very grateful. And of course, doubly grateful because this occasion, uh, the occasion for this event is uh, my colleague Natiev's uh, newest book, which I have uh, not yet, because of the shortness of time, been able to read end to end, but I've read a good deal of it uh, in the sample and dip method, uh, but always keen to read more uh, in a particular chapter or a particular section, but also trying to get a sense of a whole. And uh, his work has been, I think, of enormous significance to many of us, even in fields quite far afield uh, from his already quite multitudinous uh, interests. So I have a slightly meandering comment, but it has a, a, a kind of vertebral structure, which I hope will become evident. But the starting point is that for me, being uh, by some form of classification of social scientist, a student of uh, the present or the recent past, uh, it's great to have read this book is it, because it reminds me of my own entirely fortuitous exposure to the great conversation uh, as a graduate student in the Committee on Social Thought from 1970 to 75, a fact now buried in the mists of my own history and other people's histories, but uh, not necessarily known to many, but I was a very naive uh, traveler in, in, in that extraordinary milieu, which I mistakenly thought had something to do with the history of ideas or the great chain of being or the history of consciousness. It had nothing to do with any of those things, uh, but it had some remarkable people in it. And the, one of the many virtues of this extraordinary book by Michael is that it restores in me the sense of excitement about reading some of the great works uh, of the West over several uh, centuries, indeed uh, millennia, that too for someone who was very poorly equipped to be uh, dropped into the deep end of this particular pool, but I've been a beneficiary ever since, and I'm very glad to be back. But the, the, the route from that personal journey, which was a journey into the self-making of the West, always a work in progress from day one, uh, to this book, which is really about the same journey, but from a very particular point of view, that is the point of view of consolation, has a particular uh, uh, moment, which has to do with Hannah Arendt, who is of course an important figure for the New School, for the Committee on Social Thought at the University of Chicago. Uh, I have many stories about that, but I'll save them for another day, such as the opinion of uh, Ed Schills and Saul Bellow about Arendt after she wrote the Eichmann book, extraordinary things that I remember from 1972-73. But the big thing that my exposure to Arendt, which was transformative, leads me to, in relation to Michael's book, is can we regard consolation in the Arendtian sense, when we do it, not when we experience it, but when we try to offer it as an action? And Arendt famously said, action means starting something new in the world. And that leads, of course, to hope and other things. Can consolation be a form of action is my question to Michael or a question uh, entirely inspired by Arendt or is it some other form of fatic or other type of communication which is not really an action but maybe something even richer but it's not an action not an Arendtian action so that's one quick point the second one is a kind of readerly point because the book is so full of rich individual cases that I uh, am going to say one word about Max Weber, 
who is uh, my hero. Uh, I even hold a small position at the Bard Graduate Center, uh, which bears the name of Max Weber. Uh, I have a lot of titles, uh, though I have no salary, no position, no power, I have, I have titles of plenty, but at the Bard Graduate Center, I am the Max Weber Global Professor, uh, something like that, because he's my hero and I'm thrilled to hold that post. But here's the question about Weber. The beauty of Michael's book is that it reminded me that Weber actually takes something very important from uh, Paul, from St. Paul and the epistles. And Michael uh, picks up rightly on one part of that, which has to do with calling and vocation, their roof. But there is another part which the uh, deeply uh, not nice scholar Edward Schills, I'll leave it like that, brought to our attention as young graduate students, which is the idea of charism in charisma, comes from Paul. St. Paul in the letter to the Corinthians and elsewhere has more about charism and charisma. And the interesting thing is when we make the leap to Max Weber, which is also in Michael's book, I was led to wonder you know, that in St. Paul, charisma is a very odd thing because it's a gift that anyone could have, like God's grace. It was not the thing that had to be monopolized by one person or attributed to just one person. So there's a kind of tension between Weber's ambivalence about charisma and Paul's understanding that charisma was a gift, therefore it, 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 it wasn't democratically spread, but it could go to anyone. So a small readerly point. And my last one then is, uh, a question to Michael, and I'll stop there, which is that the greatest uh, benefit that I derived from reading and teaching uh, Michael Ignatieff's work over at least two, perhaps three decades, going back to Warrior's Honor, but before that, to his work on kinship and empathy, strangers, all that, is I took away the lesson that things that we think are both very old and very universal are neither universal nor old, such as empathy. Now, Michael would like us to think that consolation has been around in the West for a very, very long time. So I wonder if we take Ignatiev A as the question of Ignatiev B, whether we might write another book showing that consolation actually is like the woman, the wonderful woman you cited in hospices and so on, actually very young, very peculiar and very strange. And mm -hmm. that there's nothing either old or universal about it. So I put that in a provocative form, but it's actually a question from you to you. I stop there. Thanks very much for this great uh, work and as we enter to you and your colleagues for this invitation. Thank you, Michael. Why won't you address the question? <laughs> I, it, there, these are wonderful thoughts. It would be a big help to me if I could shut up and wait till come in okay. later. Because I, I think um, okay. Arjun has asked me a tough question. And I need a little, I need a pause. <laughs> I need to get the brain to work a little bit. But well. thank you, Arjun, for those very helpful remarks. You're most welcome. Uh, very well, we will then move to Jim and you hold on because there will be questions mounting, I think. The only person who doesn't have any questions, it's me at the end, so <laughs> you can relax then. Um, let me turn to uh, my colleague, uh, James Miller, Jim Miller, who is a professor of politics and liberal studies, who is also a faculty director of the MA in creative publishing and uh, critical journalism at the New School for Social Research. His later book, which did quite a bit of splash, and its important book uh, is entitled Can Democracy Work? Work? Question mark. A short history of a radical idea from ancient Athens to our world, um, which was published by Farah Strauss and Jura. Okay. And, uh, he's the author of other books, and I'm not going to talk about it, and you could read it uh, in the announcement, as I said. Um, and perhaps. I should add here like flowers in, in the dust being the rise of rock and roll, the passion of Michael uh, Foucault, democracy on the streets, that's it. Um, Jim, go ahead. 
Thank you, uh, Elzbieta. I'm going to make a few comments and then pose um, uh, 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 three direct questions. Uh, to start, I, I want to acknowledge what I regard as a primary accomplishment of Michael Ignatieff's On Consolation. I see it as an exemplary use of biographical sketches to explore moral puzzles and dilemmas through a study of exemplars rather than the development of a systematic logical argument. In its literary form, I believe this book belongs to a, an ancient tradition uh, that includes uh, Plutarch's parallel lives of the noble Greek and Roman statesmen, as well as key passages in Montaigne's essays. I could mention Emerson's representative men, but I won't go on. Um, it is a tradition that I think is um, not exactly unbroken, and uh, uh, this will lead me to uh, some comments that I think will pick up on some of what Arjun was saying. About the literary finesse of this book, I have no doubts, but the sheer variety of the lives he dramatizes begs an obvious question. What, if any, of Ignatius' exemplars should we try to emulate? Now, I use the word emulate. I noticed he himself used the word identify with, which I take to be a somewhat weaker term, but I'm going to stick with emulation for a moment because it, it's in the category of emulating exemplars uh, that I think um, I encounter um, real obstacles. Why? Many of the lives that Ignatieff recounts seem to me, at least for myself, literally inimitable, beyond imitation, beyond emulation. This is in part, I think, for historical reasons. I certainly, even though I was uh, raised as a Lutheran, lacked the historically specific spiritual and cultural resources that facilitated the deep faith or strong convictions of, say, St. Paul, or Cicero. But there are also psychological reasons I find some of his exemplars inimitable. I also happen to lack the temperament and emotional capacity to imitate, say, the happy equanimity of David Hume, who I find enviable, uh, but I can't imagine emulating uh, for reasons my therapist knows all too well. As a result, reading about uh, these particular people, I discovered didn't particularly console me, I'm afraid, at all. And um, reading the way in which uh, Ignatiev uh, uh, follows what he called in his opening statement, um, the chains of meaning, strands across time, sometimes when I was following him, it seemed to me those strands were hopelessly broken that they weren't available to me um, uh, to identify with or emulate in the way that he is proposing. Uh, in effect, uh, I, I, since we're at the New School and since um, uh, Hannah Arendt is apparently our secular saint, I will mention her idea of a radical break with tradition. And it seems to me that, uh, and uh, I understood uh, Arjun to say something similar, that uh, Michael Ignatieff proceeds as if tradition is, um, uh, has a continuity and there's a temporal continuity across time. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, I would just add, uh, you know, I could imagine that he himself as the author was greatly consoled by writing the book. And perhaps it doesn't matter that I as a reader was not consoled. Uh, but this leads me to three direct questions. On page 169, Michael, you mentioned Nietzsche, quote, the only consolation entitled to respect, Nietzsche once said, was to believe that no consolation was possible. What if Nietzsche, as you paraphrase him, is right? On page 209, you yourself write, quote, history has no consolations to offer because it never ends and its meaning is never settled. And the endlessness and, and um, lack of settling, the lack of a teleological order, order to history as you understand it, 
uh, seems to me to point um, uh, uh, to, to suggest that perhaps there's something to what Nietzsche is saying, um, as they're uh, in part because um, history does represent really sharp breaks uh, uh, that make it hard um, to connect with. Um, exemplars that were once uh, absolutely central to uh, an earlier civilization. And I won't even remark on the whole question of uh, the different traditions of the West and of China and India, uh, which creates a pluralistic set of questions that uh, Michael knows very well from uh, having studied Isaiah Berlin. Okay, second question. Jean Amory who survived Auschwitz along with Primo Levi, famously argued in his essay at the mind's limits that a well-furnished mind, culturally speaking, was of little use in that setting. Quote, this is Omri, quote, if the intellect was not centered around a religious or political belief, it was of no help or of little help. With a strength of conviction deserving to be called faith, Omri observed, quote, or sorry, without a strength of conviction that deserves to be called faith. Omri observed, quote, the intellect very abruptly lost its basic quality, its transcendence. He, of course, is using a Kantian term here. Uh, Primo Levi, who was otherwise sharply critical of Omri, couldn't stand him actually, agreed on this point. The believers, uh, I quote uh, Primo Levi, lived better. The believers lived better. Both Omri and I observed this. This is Primo Levi in The Drowned and the Saved. The basis of the strong belief, according to both uh, Omri and Levi, it didn't matter. Faithful Marxists and Zionists and Catholics and Jewish rabbis all fared better at Auschwitz than secular intellectuals like Omri and Levi, and I assume like Michael Ignatieff and myself. Yet at the end of uh, the book, Michael, you assert essentially the opposite when you write on page 259, quote, in dark times, nothing as abstract as faith in history, progress, salvation, or revolution will do us much good. Why did you choose to discount the powerful evidence of what Omri and Levy observed at Auschwitz? Second question. And the third question is very short. Can we really sustain hope without something akin to faith? And uh, the example that you give that I think is instructive in this regard is Václav Havel and his turn towards a kind of mystical spirituality at the end of his life. And uh, you don't talk about it in your book, but I do wonder what you make of it uh, if we integrate that aspect of his biography into the example you make out of him. And thank you uh, very much for a, a very provocative book. I'm sure you want to wait. Do you, Michael, and collect the questions? Wait. I have to wait. This is getting tougher and tougher. So I don't get all the time I get. But thank, thank you, Jim. That was very, very helpful. Um, we'll wait for Avishai. Uh, Avishai Margalit is emeritus professor of uh, philosophy at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. It's very late for him already. It's much later than for Arjun uh, in uh, Berlin or, uh, or Michael in Vienna. So we appreciate, appreciate it very much that he's with us. Uh, this outstanding contemporary thinker um, on human condition, the moral foundations of our times and the problems confronting Western society, societies, I should say, and he was a professor at the um, Institute for Advanced Studies at Princeton University. He taught at Harvard and Oxford. Um, he is a, 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 an observer, a highly regarded observer of the conflicts between Israel and Palestine and, and a commentator on the relation uh, as between Islam and the West. He has written a considerable number of books, including The Decent Society on compromise and rotten compromises and more recently on betrayal. He has received a uh, number of prizes. Again, you can, you can go to the announcement and read it all and awards, including the Spinoza Lens Prize and the Israel Pro uh, Prize for Philosophy. And I want to 
uh, emphasize how incredibly lucky to, uh, for us to, is to have you with us today, Abishai. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. And thanks Michael for his fine and elegant book on an intricate topic. We were advised to end with a question and I'll open with a question. And the question has to do with what we just heard, namely, what the, is the relation between consolation and being truthful? Mm -hmm. If I understand you, Michael, right, rightly, you think that not being truthful is not consoling. And it's, the issue is not just being sincere. You can be sincere and wrong. The issue is of being truthful. And this brings me to the topic that I would like to talk about, namely on Job and the Psalms, and to concentrate on that. Whether we, the question is whether we read Job in the same way. Job, the book, is a very peculiar one. It's in a way the most subversive book in the Bible. It undermines an assumption which is shared by all the books in the Bible, namely that the divine justice is retributive justice in this world. There is no afterlife in the Bible. No kingdom come in the Bible, in the Hebrew Bible. And uh, therefore, being suffering calls for explanation, namely, suffering is a punishment. And being ill, skin with skin disease as job, it's a punishment for a sin for something wrong that you did. And Job, we know right from the prolegomena of the book that he is innocent. And there is a wager, a cruel wager between God and the Satan, who is basically the attorney general of God's counsel. And uh, about the righteousness of Job. And the Satan doesn't reject the idea that Job behaved properly and righteously. What he doubts is his motivation because he leads very prosperous and successful life. He's rich has children and a family and being respected by all. He's prospering in this world. Therefore, there is nothing for him to complain and why not to be righteous? That's what the Satan tries to test. And as you remember, a series of catastrophes waiting to job, namely, destroying his, his property, killing his children, and then inflicting horrible skin disease on Job himself. And Job is absolutely convinced that he's innocent. And he calls God for a try. It's not now here we come to the issue between Michael and me in reading the book of Job. We go the same way up to a point and then we differ. As you remember, there are three friends who came from afar to console Job. They sit for a whole week saying nothing. 
because they see the sorrow, the deep sorrow in Job, and then they torment him. And they torment him by a doctrine. And the doctrine is that the God's justice is retributive justice. You are rewarded and you are punished measure for measure. And you should be, and the, one of them said, if you suffer so much and you are in this situation with all these catastrophes, you obviously made something terribly wrong. And the others said, maybe you are innocent. If so, you will be rewarded and compensated for the time that you are so miserable. And then there is this amazing four chapters in the book, God's appearance in the storm, really. And the question that puzzled all the interpreters, what, what is the answer? What's God's answer? It seems so irrelevant because Job's question is very simple. Why an innocent man is suffering? And we can complement it, why wicked people prosper. And it's all in this world because there are no afterlife in the, in the Hebrew Bible. The afterlife came as a, as a way of addressing this problem by postponing the day of payment, namely afterlife. And the, so the retributive justice is holding true, but in the kingdom come, if you will, and not necessarily in our world. But that's a different issue. But the question is, God suddenly tells Job that, I mean, about the creation and about the world. And the question is, what is the which should console Job? Actually, it should depress him no end. Now, Michael thinks that the consolation is double-edged. One, that God confirms that Job is innocent, and the other, that he answers him. And uh, the, the, the epistle, the James epistle, is that uh, introduce to Christianity the notion of the patience of Job, namely the willingness to wait for revelation or for encounter with God. So Michael thinks that these two things are what should console or did console Job. And I read it differently. I think that what the answer is, this seemingly irrelevant answer, is the following. Human beings, I mean, the moral order is not part of the fabric of the world. The world is indifferent to morality. It's amoral, it's not immoral. It's not an evil world, and it's not a good world. It's an amazing creation but not a good world in the moral sense. It's an indifferent world. And I think that this is a very different religious perspective. So what should, why should you be consoled? By the knowledge that you should worship God, and be devoted and pious for its own sake and not for any reward and not expecting either punishment or reward. The world is indifferent and you should out of this knowledge and see what the world is like, be devoted 
And the consolation is in this reply, namely what is disturbing in the religious, in the conventional religious view is this retributive justice. And the, the retributive justice is anthropocentric, as if the world is made for you. Now, in his answer, God says, rain falls in the desert and in places that no one lives, where no human beings are around. And therefore, it's not, I didn't create the rainfall just to provide human necessities. It's not for you. You are just part of the whole universe. And that's, I think, a very different perspective. And, the, and then God says that only Job spoke truthfully and his friends who became his tormentors, uh, he didn't say that they are hypocrites, but they didn't speak, they didn't speak the truth. And the question is, again, whether consolation goes with being truthful. What God would, at no point, Job started doubting the existence of God, but he mistrusted, he lost his trust in God, in the moral universe. And now he knows that the moral universe is a human or is a creation which is not in, it's not part of the fabric of the world. And that's basically, I think, leads to all other, actually, it leads to other non-believers. They can live with this answer much better with a consolation that is based on, on future life or afterlife. After all, Michael, you couldn't console your friend about uh, him meeting his wife because you don't believe it. Moreover, for all you know, it's not true. No one returned from there, but that's not a good reason to believe in it. So the issue again is, and, and here there is a difference between the sound. The sound that you quote, the 23rd chapter, there, there is total trust in God and God is on my side, no matter what. That's not the book of Job. And that's not where Job stands. Mm -hmm. And I think that the book of Job is really, I think, far more, I think we are in the grip of an old picture which, which Job shattered. And now we are much closer to Job's, to the answer that, that Job received than to anything that is consoling with rewards and punishment. Mm -hmm. So thank you again for having us think about those problems. And uh, I'm, I'm truly grateful and repeat my question. Do we need, can we console out of sincerity but being wrong, whether you count it as consolation or not. Mm -hmm. Boy. Yeah. Uh, hold on, Michael. I'm going. I'm not going to ask you a question, <laughs> um, but it will give you perhaps a, 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 a respite. Your book poses question, as we heard, but it actually also inspires the reader, and, and it inspired me to think about 
you know, my own, our own source of consolation or perhaps comfort or perhaps actually less than that, calm. So I have much more pedestrian thoughts to share. Uh, whatever I am to say does not measure to what you um, call moments of extremity. Though to a certain extent, it reverberates some parts of what Avishai was saying. So in times of despair, for me, uh, for many of us, there are stories and there is poetry. But, but then for me, it is also action. And, and, and this is how, uh, uh, how we put by acting, in my opinion, how we put ourselves back together. Uh, in, in, ta in times like that, I read poetry, the very poetry that you also read, the wise poetry of, of sage Czesław Miłosz, Miłosz who knows and whose words provide me once, and I'm not going to go back to it because uh, Arjun didn't and I will not, but it provided me once uh, at the time of major crisis that have landed me in the hospital with comfort. So he said the past is inaccurate. Whoever lives long enough knows how much what he has seen with his own eyes becomes overgrown with rumor, legend, uh, magnifying or belittling hearsay. It was not that, like that at all, um, he would like to exclaim, but he will not, for they would have seen only his moving clips without hearing his voice. So there is Miłosz and there is Szymborska, and I want to bring in this extraordinary woman poet. Uh, yes, poets writing in my own native tongues are my resources, not just because those are two Nobel Prize winners. If you, if you put Miłosz and Szymborska together, they are actually a peculiar, unlikely couple. Miłosz with his vivid, thick, sen thick kind of sensuality, I guess, a, a clear sense that there is something beyond matter. Uh, his sense of mystery and capacity to see evil. And, and Szymborska in his poetry, there are no metaphysics, no theology, but an intent to construct a distance to reality so we can actually see things clearly, more clearly, and perhaps actually that could help us. So I was 14, maybe 13 or 14. I don't remember exactly when I first discovered a small volume of her poetry on the bottom shelf of a, of a bookstore in a small town that I come from in Poland. And, and soon I memorized the poem. I even recited it in various places. I got a word for rec re reciting it, but stayed with me very deeply. It is written in the form of, di of a dialogue with an inanimate object, and it's called conversation with a stone. Stone is the inanimate object. Nevertheless, the stone is in a dialogue with, with the author or with me. So here is the first verse of that, of that poem. I knock at the stone's front door. It's only me, let me come in. I want to enter your insights, have a look around. Even if you break me to pieces, answers stone, we'll all still be closed. You can grind us to sand and we still won't let you in. The poem is actually quite long and, and the poet or I, who at, at that time, clearly identify with her. I, I, I'm trying to persuade the stone to allow me to enter. I knock at the stores down five times, giving all the good reasons for my desire to enter, curiosity, my quest for knowledge and learning. The fact that I don't have much time because I'm mortal and um, uh, I cannot wait. Uh, I demonstrate a considerable resilience in, 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 in facing continuous arguments that justify that stone's refusal. Uh, my persuasion and, and, and eventually my begging, I almost beg him, right? And uh, do not work. And, and I'm confronted with the actually utter alienness, so to speak, of the stone. I'm encountering here a clearly different kind of being, uh, a, a, a different kind of consciousness that I'm not, I'm clearly unable actually to comprehend. Indifferent, perhaps? And though we do see uh, seem to kind of communicate, um, our communication is rather illusory. So when I knock at the door of the entry door of the stone the, for the last time saying, it's only me, let me come in. I actually hear the stone and that's the li last line of the poem saying, 
I don't have door. I don't have a door. Uh, so at least I realized that I was dealing with a radically different remote being whose existence through the you know, part of nature was completely different from mine. Uh, and in fact, was unknowable and uh, unimaginable. So the stone that, you know, secular indifferent voice of that stone was telling me, yes, I'm here and I understand you, but you have to understand that my reality is not yours and that uh, and, and you have to honor it. You have to respect it. Well, you have to respect this autonomy. I don't have door. So now to hear that I finally accept that was somehow somewhat very comforting to me. I have to respect it. I have to honor it. And it brings me to action. Something I also turn to when I need comfort personally. And this brings me to Havel's well-known definition of hope that you, are, that, you, that you are quoting. That's definitely not the same thing as optimism. It's not the conviction uh, that something will turn out well, but the certainty that something makes sense regardless of how it turns out. I love this piece, of course. I, I love this, this, this quote and I love this thought. I completely understand why, uh, as you like look back at those in need of consolation, in your powerful chapter on Havel, you explore the letters to Olga, because this is where, uh, when Havel's pain and Havel's suffering comes out uh, sharper than anywhere else. Um, otherwise hidden, it's hidden. It's a kind of, this is a book, provides us with this land of pain and, and, and despair. I have to say though, that um, although I was aware of it, I, I had never really thought about Havel in those terms. In other words, that, that stuff that it's so important for you because you are looking for individual sources of despair and how people dealt with it is somewhat is somewhat, in my case, while reading Havel, uh, covered by other stuff he did. And, um, and uh, it was not long after he left the prison that you described, you know, in, in just one year later that uh, he wrote The Power of the Powerless, right? Which opened up a path that inspired and provided hope for, for many. And, uh, and it was soon when it was published and it was published first in Polish, he wrote it on the, uh, he, was, he was commissioned by Adam Michnik to his underground journal, Kritika. Um, uh, so soon it was then disseminated and Kritika had 5,000 copies that you know circulated around Poland. It was, they were workers, they were workers from the Ursus tractor factory who said, <laughs> you know, also famously at the moment, already we know that because they repeated many times, we, had re we have uh, read Havel and now we know what to do. And mm -hmm. uh, one year later, 19, 1980, the, book, the, the, the essay was published in uh, 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 1979. Solidarity was born and, and, and not just a trade union, not just a social movement, but a, a kind of an inflection point for whole society that so hope and could and, and, and they saw that they could learn together. Together is an important thing here. It's also for Aaron very important. Uh, you can learn how to deal with despair. So togetherness is such an important condition for action, and loneliness is not. Um, workers and dissidents, intellectuals came together, and then the society came together. I'm talking about it because togetherness and 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 and, and social solidarity was an important lesson, a lesson which was somewhat forgotten in the recent years everywhere, but which at least for the time being now has become visible again and it's been re-emerging in the crowded streets of such unpronounceable cities like Przemysl, Rzeszów, oh, also. Are you ready to answer the questions? <laughs> Um, well, first of all, it's just Im important for me to thank um, Elizabeth and James and Avisha and Arjun. Um, let me try and say a few things in response. Um, I thought uh, a kind of humorous reaction first. Whenever you write a book and you, you think you're finished with it, this has been one of those evenings where I suddenly realized it's not finished at all. <laughs> Um, you guys have given me a, a lot to think about, and I think there's another, there's something else I have to do here. And that's, a, that's in, in, in many ways, 
my way of expressing my gratitude to you. Let me just pick up a couple of things. Um, uh, Arjun uh, mentioned this point about um, Arendt, is consolation an action? I, I think that's very insightful thought. I, I do think that consolation is an action because I see it as a, as a very concrete form of human solidarity. It, it takes two, as it were. It's a, it's a, it, it may be mediated with, you know, propositions and words, but it's basically two people um, confronting um, uh, loss, pain, grief. And what's fascinating to me about it as an action is that it is the place where we reach the very limits of empathy, solidarity, words, meanings, um, but I think it is emphatically an action, and um, uh, and I want to kind of honor that in some sense. I, 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 I want to get us back to that. Consolation is a very old word. It's loaded with all kinds of religious associations, but we're in fact consoling people all the time, or we're comforting them. I make a distinction between comfort and consolation throughout Comfort, if I was comforting Elisabetta, I wouldn't have to say a word. But if I'm consoling Elisabetta, I have to offer her some set of propositions that make her feel better. Um, and this is where we get to the, the difficult problem of truth that Avishai raised. Elizabeth is a very intelligent person, even if she wasn't. Um, I can't get away with any set of propositions to Elisabetta. They have to have, they have to appear to be truthful to her. And uh, if I give her a bunch of old flannel, um, uh, it won't work. And similarly, when I console myself, um, I have a strong urge to tell myself a happy story. For example, when I, I have failed, prominently in my life and what you you console yourself by saying I gave it my best shot I left nothing on my table I did my very best well really really <laughs> um, uh, you know when you console yourself you're in a very difficult encounter with um, our inveterate desire to deceive ourselves and to tell ourselves happy stories um, we when we lose someone, we say uh, our love for them goes on. But the fact is they're not there. They're not in the room. They're gone. They're dead. And so the idea that love remains alive is <laughs> partly true and partly false. You know what I mean? So the consolation is a constant. I, all I would say, Avishai, is a constant struggle with truth. And frankly, False consolation is, is consolation based on lies or self-deception or illusion. Um, and um, I read the comforter, Job's comforters as um, trying to force Job into accepting um, uh, the justice of God's retri retribution and you know, um, Job simply does not that regard that as true. He will not be consoled by propositions that he regards as just false. Um, and, and so in a way, that's why I began with Job. I, I think, Avishai, you've, um, you've added a whole dimension to this, which um, uh, particularly in your analysis of God's speech, which I think is tremendously insightful, because it's very hard to understand that speech. But when you said um, that moral order is not part of the fabric of this world, um, and that's what God is telling Job, I think that's a dimension of God's speech that I didn't understand. And so all I can say is I'm very grateful. I, it, makes me want to go back to Job and, and read it again. But what I do hear in Job in this shaking his fist at the sky is a insistent demand for meaning, which I think is at the root of 
consolation as a as a as a practice as an action um and um and that's why i began with job because i feel he's somehow taking upon himself the burden of trying to find meaning in a world where as i think you're now helping me to see moral order is not a part of the natural world it's not a part of god's world it's a such moral order as there is in the world is a is a human creation um, against impossible and difficult odds. But <clears throat> there's much more to say about that. But I I do think there is a relationship between consolation and truth, and it's agonizingly painful. It's one of the reasons I spent some time looking at Havel because Havel is you actually see a man lying to himself and then discovering that he can't live with this lie. Um, and struggles to find a truthful uh, relationship to a shameful um, episode. Um, so that's something about Arjun's point about action. It, 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 it is an action because it involves human beings in real space and real times engaging with each other. And it is a test of what kinds of actions between human beings can actually work as speech acts, as embraces as understanding. Um, and then I've said a little bit about what um, Abishai said about um, truth. And, um, but then let's get to the most, in a way, the, Jim's questions are very challenging and they're, they're really about the relationship, I think, between um, uh, consolation and faith. And before I address that, let me just pick up something that I think was part of what Arjun said and Jim said, which is just about the historicity of this. Um, um, I think one of the lines I'm, I'm working on, which didn't work for Jim at all, but does work for me, is that the languages of consolation have an obvious historicity. I mean, you know, they're... Um, you know, you, Weber is writing in the whole context of Nietzsche, the death of God, the, the stuff. Weber would be simply incomprehensible to, you know, Martin Luther, Jean Calvin, or possibly even Montaigne. Um, so there's deep historicity in the evolution of these languages. So that's, that's clear. But perhaps in slight contradiction to that, I, I do feel that the action of consolation is a continuous human experience through time, taking very different historical forms and very different kinds of languages. Um, and to give you, and, and some of the consolation practices in the past are incomprehensible to us. Cicero spends a lot of time in his letter saying, I've got to put up a statue to my daughter. You know, what's that about? I mean, and and what's weird about it is he actually thinks she is divine and she wants, he wants to consecrate her divinity. I mention that simply to say, I don't feel all these figures are easy to approach or easy to understand precisely because of their historicity. They're, the past is a different country. But having said that, I then cut against it by saying, I think there is a, there is a deep continuity um, in human experience across time such that you can read the Psalms, as I said, with a profound sense of identification. That is, you can hear another human being across a huge distance of time saying, I am lonely. <laughs> I am as lonely as a sparrow on a rooftop. Why, God, have you left me? Why have you abandoned me? It's the Psalms are eloquent descriptions of, a, of human abandonment. And the fact that we were still reading them in the, you know, the Gideon Bibles in hotels around the world to this day works not because people oh, think, oh, I must read the Psalms because everybody, because when you read them, you hear what it is to be lonely, frightened, and afraid. And that identification, that connection is in itself consoling, is the claim I make. And it's a claim that cuts across time. And, and so I'm saying on the one hand, yes, languages are very historical. On the other hand, I'm saying there is a connection we can 
established with them through time. Um, I, I'm not surprised that Jim finds none of these stories very it doesn't identify with them. I'm not sure that was my intention. Um, and I, I, you know, I, I, I think it's, it's um, in, entirely right. But let me now come, as we come to a conclusion to the Jean Emery point, which I think is fundamental. You're quite right to, to raise the question of whether consolation is possible at all without faith. Um, but then faith in what? I mean, I think what I end up finding myself saying is I have a deep faith in the continuity of human experience through time. And I think that this was part of what held Primo Levi together. That's why the quotation from Dante is important because it connects him backwards a thousand years and it gives him a sense of futurity in which men will not treat each other as brutes and they will be <laughs> capable of knowledge and freedom. And that, that is, I think, a secular faith perhaps that I think, um, I just don't know what would happen in extremity to me. I don't know whether my faith, that faith in human continuity through time would sustain me. I, I'm, all bets might be off here. As I say, I don't want to get into happy talk, but <laughs> I, I think there is a faith connected, a, a sense of continuity with the past that gives you faith in futurity, in the fact that there will be a future. You may not see it, but there will be a future. There will be a human future. Um, and, and, and that is, I think, what I was trying to evoke above all in the in the book. And I think I, I, I possibly could have said it more clearly. And I think you're right, Jim, that I, I give Václav Havel's faith rather short shrift. And it may be that one of the things that gives him hope is a faith that is semi-religious in, 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 in character. Um, I'm very struck by these final images of, of, of Havel. Incredible. You know, he straightens books on his desk and asks himself, "Why am I? Who? Who am I straightening books for?" And he thinks, "Well, the judge is coming." Well, that's a fascinating moment in Havel's life. The judge is coming. Oh. So that is a kind of, of of faith that I think possibly anchored him and and sustained his his hope. Look, we've come to the end of this, but I again thank you so much for this. I'm I'm going to obviously have to go back to the drawing board and think again about all of these comments because they've been tremendously helpful and rather challenging and rather unsettling but hey that's what we were trying to do i think anyway thank you all thank you so so much thank you everybody i i like to finish with uh i, I know that what would be great now is to have a conversation between you guys but i think we cannot do that anymore but i like to to turn to uh, the question, and, I, and, and I'm looking at and the first question that I got, it's from Sanjay Ruparelia, who, who used to be our colleague at the New School. And uh, welcome back, Sanjay. Um, and he writes, this is a very, I think it's a comment mostly. Um, this is a very rich conversation, especially the substantive questions raised about whether consolation is possible, for what purposes, and under what conditions. I would be unable to stay until the end. Oh, wow, you're not here, okay. Um, due to another commitment, unfortunately, but it struck me that Michael's methodological approach reflects that of Isaiah Berlin, of many voices in conversation. Does this inform the continuities of meaning he traces across many stretches? Arjun seemed skeptical of this approach. Uh, other approaches to intellectual history, such as the Cambridge School, generally are two. Does consolation have a singular meaning, even if it is practiced differently by its advocates? Mm -hmm. I think it's an interesting comment and question, in part actually addressed already by, by, by you here. I simply wanted to thank you tremendously. Um, 
Thank going you. by the book, going by the book, uh, everything is on chat. You can on on uh, you can see the information, how to get it, read it, read it, and think about it. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Arjun. Thank you, Avisha. You must be exhausted at the time of the of the night for you. Thank you, Jim, and thank you very much, Lala Pop, who is our good angel just behind the screens to uh, that made sure that everything works out. So, thank you very much and. Um, Good afternoon and good night. Good evening. Thank you all.